Let's take our Bibles this morning. Let's turn to Revelation chapter number 2, please. The book of Revelation chapter number 2. I praise the Lord for that song. And uh, You'll go through some things in your life uh, where you'll thank God that God's bigger than whatever you're dealing with. And many of y'all are even now, I know, dealing with different problems, wayward children, uh, cancer, sicknesses, death in the family, disappointment, a whole lot of things that... Uh, can seem like they're bigger than you. And that's because they are. Uh, but they're not bigger than Him. Amen? They're not bigger than the Lord. I do. I, I praise the Lord for that this morning. Amen? Revelation chapter number 2. I was reminded of something Brother Scott Peake was telling me right before. The, well, I'm not going to tell him what you said during our shaking hands time. But it reminded me of a joke. And uh, Brother Adrian Rogers, I was listening to him preach online uh, today. Obviously online. He's in heaven. Um, but... Uh, he said, I was talking to this lady at our church, and she said, Preacher, I have never seen your eyes before. And uh, she said, well, why is that? He said, she said, because when you pray, you close yours, and when you preach, you close mine. So um, I thought that was pretty good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to do that this morning, amen? I'm going to try not to close your eyes, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll have our eyes open, amen, and see what the Lord has for us. I thank God for my Bible, amen? I really do love my Bible. I don't love it as much as I should, but I do love it. And I want to love it more. And I hope and pray that God will talk to us from the Bible. We've been studying through Revelation chapter 2 and 3, looking at these seven churches of Asia Minor. The last time that we were here was actually the Sunday before Easter. So it took about a month or so off. And so I'm going to give a little bit of review as to what we've been looking at. And my prayer is that God would encourage all of us to be the church that God wants us to be in these last days. And that's kind of how we're looking at these seven churches. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus, by the pen of John, dictates these letters to these literal churches. And these are literal churches. That's one way that we're looking at it. Three different perspectives. One is, this is the literal perspective. That these were physical churches that were real. They all abided uh, in the country that you and I would now call Turkey, in that, Asia, that area called Asia Minor. And, and so you can go there. You can visit the physical ruins of each of these literal churches today. So there's the literal perspective. There is the historical perspective. And that is that each of these churches represents a different period of time in church history. You've heard people say that you and I are in the Laodicean church age, right? I believe that. I believe that. By the way, that's the last one before Jesus comes back. Amen? Praise the Lord. But that, that, I believe that's where we are. And so you can look at these churches uh, by that and through that lens, Ephesus would be during the time of the apostles. Smyrna was the time during the great persecution from about 60 to 300 A.D. And then we're looking at this church, the third church, which is Pergamos, which would be from about 313 A.D. to about 590. And it begins with Emperor Constantine there in Rome making Christianity the, the, uh, the state religion, putting an end to that great persecution period where Christians were being martyred and slaughtered by the thousands. And you would think that the church would do better without persecution, uh, but that's not the case. The church does better under persecution. Uh, the church throughout history has always done better under persecution. I think that may be part of the apathy and the reason why there's so much indifference towards uh, spiritual things in our day is because you and I don't have to suffer for our faith. We really don't. We're, we're, we, we got it pretty good, right? Nobody's coming in here trying to cut our heads off or coming to church. We don't have to whisper victory in Jesus. We can sing it loud. We should sing it loud because we can sing it loud. But not everywhere in this world can people sing it loud. Sing victory in Jesus with their voice. They have to whisper it. They have to hide their faith. You and I, we don't have to suffer much for our faith. And because of that, we don't have as much skin in the game, if you will, as some other people have had. And I think that leads to the indifference and the apathy of our day. But this period of time, the church at Pergamos lays the foundation for the Roman Catholic Church that will come in the next period of time. So we're looking at it from a historical perspective as well. And then thirdly, we're looking at this from a typical perspective and that would be this there are seven different kinds of churches there are seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 and I believe there are seven different types or kinds of churches that you and I could be 
uh, today. And so we began looking at the church in Pergamos. This is the capital city of that province of Asia Minor. It was the most wealthy city, had the most connections. You had all the politicians and everybody lived there. By the way, politicians normally bring with them a whole lot of sin and baggage. Amen. We could all say amen to that. And so that's what Pergamos was dealing with. Just as Smyrna, by the way, just as Smyrna was named for its chief export, which was myrrh, I told you that Pergamos was named after pergament, or which is parchment. It's a kind of a paper that they had produced. And so because of their ability to produce paper, they had uh, built probably the second largest library in the world at that time. 200,000 volumes that were, that were there at the library in Pergamos. And because of that, because of all of those books and all of those volumes being written, you had uh, a lot of secular ideas and secular philosophies just like in our day that we're dealing with, right, that were seeping into the church and were corrupting the church from the doctrines that they were supposed to believe in. We'll read uh, the letter and then we'll go back through. Let's begin in verse number 12, Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 12. The Bible says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and, and, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. We'll, we'll stop reading there. The last time that we were here, uh, we read that big old long portion, portion of Scripture, and then we just preached on verse 12. Uh, I, want, I hope I don't disappoint y'all when I do that. I, I tease you with this big old long passage of Scripture, and then I just deal with one verse. But that's what we did. We looked at the preface to this letter, which is in verse 12. And in the preface of this letter, I've told you with each letter, Jesus Christ introduces himself in a new and a different way. And each introduction of Christ just so happens to be exactly what that church needs. I'm glad that Jesus is the answer. Amen? He's the answer to whatever's wrong in your life. Whatever problem you have going, Jesus is the answer. And I told you the, the problem with the church at Pergamos, as we're going to see today, is this word, compromise. This was a church of compromise. And because of that, Jesus introduces himself as he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. We know from Revelation chapter 1 that that sharp sword is proceeding out of the mouth of Christ. It is the Word of God, right? The Bible says the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so when Jesus says, I am he which hath the sharp sword with two edges, what he's saying is the answer to your compromise is me and the Word of God. Jesus says, if you've got Jesus right and you've got the Bible right, then you can fix the compromise in your church. Amen. You can fix the problems that you have. And so he introduces himself as the Word of God, at, which is the answer to their problems. That is the preface. And we'll look today in verse number 13. We'll begin with the praise. The praise to the church at Pergamos. It says, uh, I, it begins in verse 13, I know thy works. Every letter, all seven letters, he begins with that statement saying, I know thy works. And what Jesus is doing is he is claiming to be familiar with everything that has happened in that church. Remember, Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, right? That means Jesus is telling them, hey, I've been attending your services. I've been attending your church service. He's saying, I know everything about your church. Listen, Jesus knows everything about this church, right? When we gather together, He's with us in the midst, right? I mean, I believe Jesus attends our church. Thank God for that, amen? Uh, thank God. I believe Jesus attends the church. And so when He attends the church, He sees all of the victories. Thank God for that. He sees all of the highs, but He also sees all of the lows. He sees all of the failures and the disappointments. He sees when you fell into sin this week, Jesus saw that, right? When you came to church to worship, Jesus saw that. When you, uh, when you were, were, were giving and, and followed the Spirit of God and witnessed to somebody this week, Jesus Christ saw that. When he says, I know thy works, what he's saying is, I'm qualified to talk to you about what's going on because I know what's going on. 
I'm glad nothing has escaped the mind of God. Nothing escapes the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's omniscient and He knows all things. And so He begins by commending them, by, by telling them some good things that they've done. And I appreciate the Lord for doing that. Amen. He could have started off real mean, uh, but you could say in a way he's, uh, he's kind of greasing the skids, right? He's trying to butter them up a little bit. You could say by just saying, hey, look, I know the good things that you have going on there at the church at Pergamos. He praises them for staying in place, for staying in place. Verse 13 says, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. He says, you are dwelling, that, word, that means to reside permanently, right? So he's saying you're staying in place, you're dwelling in a place. The Bible says that's where Satan's seat is. That word seat, it speaks, you could think of a throne, right? You think about authority. What he's telling us here, and one thing we can say for sure, is that Satan is not in hell. I know the world tells you that, the comic books tell you that, So the, the, the society makes you think that, that Satan's in hell. No, he's not in hell. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Right? Job chapter 1, uh, the Lord asked Satan, where have you been? He says, from going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. That's what Satan is doing today. He's not in hell. God is the one running hell. People have this weird idea that Satan is down there, you know, pitching coal into the furnace to make hell hotter. No, hell belongs to God. Amen? He's the one running hell. Satan's not running hell. And so Satan, the Bible says, he's in the earth and he's seeking whom he may devour. And when this Bible says that Pergamos was Satan's seat, it's saying that Satan, it was essentially the devil's headquarters was in Pergamos. It was, it was a place, it was Satan's seat of authority in that era and in that time. And what Jesus is doing is he's commending them for their willingness to stay put where he put them despite the sin that surrounded them. That's a blessing to me this morning. Amen? You and I are in a world of sin. We live in a world that has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't want to have nothing to do with the Bible. They don't want to have nothing to do with the gospel. They, they're, the, they're the crowd that says that evil's good and good, good is evil. And you and I have to abide that. Right? You and I have to live in that. You and I have to dwell in that. And listen, you could be uh, sorry for that and get upset about it. Listen, what it is, it's an opportunity. God has put you and I in this place and in this time for us to shine as lights for Christ. You and I shouldn't balk at that. We shouldn't be upset by that. We should thank God that He's willing to use us in a dark time. Just like He's using this church at Pergamos in a dark place. Some people say that. They say, well, you know, they complain. I'd much rather have been born in the 1700s, you know, with those great, great awakenings and, the, and Jonathan Edwards, move, move of God and all that in the 1800s. Me, personally, I like air conditioning. Can I get a witness, right? I know it's loud in here. We like it. We just like to be reminded that air conditioning exists, and I'm thankful for that. And so I, I, think, I, I think we should thank God that He let us be uh, in the time where we are, right? God knows best, amen? He knew exactly when to put us. He didn't, know, he didn't just know exactly where to put us. He knew when to put us. And He put us right here. He put us in this place and for this time and for a specific purpose. And what you and I need to do is not be looking around. You and I are so tempted by uh, the, gr the greener grass down the road. Amen? We want to look around and say, well, I'd rather be doing this, I'd rather be doing that. No, God rewards faithfulness. He's, he's praising them for staying in place. He's saying, hey, thank y'all for not moving down to the church at Ephesus down the road. Thank you for not heading off to Smyrna or to Thyatira. I put you in Pergamos, and I'm glad, I'm thankful that you're dwelling there and you're abiding in the place that I put you in. Amen? So that's what he's praising them for. The Bible says in this in Proverbs 24, verse 21, it says, my, it says, my son... Fear thou the Lord and the King. And he says this, And meddle not with them that are given to change. Meddle not with them that are given to change. God wants us to have some stability in our life. Amen? God wants us to stay in place. When God gives orders, you stay there until God gives other orders. And he's commending this church, Hey, thank you for being willing to stay in, in a place, even though it's Satan's seat. You're right there where I told you to be. And he's commending them uh, for that. When he talks about Satan's seat, there are a few different theories about what exactly that's referring to. Uh, I'll give you a few of them. One would be that, the, and again, this, temp, this place at Pergamos was full of idolatry, full of pagan worship. And one of the gods that they worshipped was uh, the god of healing, and his name was Ascalopius. 
Uh, they'll ask me to say that again, but that's, that's the God of healing. That's who they worshipped. And he was said to have had a temple there. People would go there and buy incense in this pagan temple, and they would offer that incense as a way to try to buy healing or to prevent themselves from getting sick. It was basically health insurance, all right? That was their pagan health insurance, was to go down to the temple of the false god and burn the incense and hope that they don't get sick. So that's one theory about it. The second one would be that this is referencing the temple of Zeus, uh, there was a temple there uh, to Zeus. It, it, stood up, it, it was up on this ledge overlooking the city, and people said that it looked like a throne. Uh, Zeus was worshipped as the god of all gods, right? There were sacrifices on those steps to the temple uh, to Zeus that were offered 24 hours a day. There was a continual smoke rising up from the temple to Zeus there in Pergamos. And what that did was it was a symbol uh, and a sign to the whole area that Satan is alive and well in this city. And so it could be a reference to that. I personally lean towards this third opinion. I say that because it's the most popular one and I really have no idea. But, but, but what they'll say is that this is a reference to emperor worship. Uh, there was a temple here built to Augustus in 29 uh, BC and, and all citizens were supposed to go to this temple. And, they were, and, and I say that particularly because, remember I told you, this was basically the capital city of that area, right? People make a god out of politics. Amen. People make a god out of that. People will worship and bow at the altar of politics. And so it just seems to me that that would make sense. That's what's going on in this period of time. Domitian, actually, in the previous age, there in this city of Pergamos, he, he said that he was to be referred to as our great Lord and God, an emperor who, decla who declared himself to be God. And so they believed in that. They worshipped these Caesars and, uh, and, and these political leaders there in this area. But regardless, he's commending them for staying place in a sinful place. And I, I, I praise the Lord for that. Secondly, he praises them for staying in place, but he praises them for standing in power. Who he says, he says, And thou holdest fast my name, verse 13, And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. He says, In the middle of all that, you held fast to my name, and you didn't deny my faith. I told you that this period of time represents um, in, in the early church history from about 313 to 590 A.D. And you could refer to this area of time as, or this period of time as pagan Rome. This is pagan Rome. They're worshiping all these false gods. And what that's going to do is it set the stage for papal Rome that will come down the road. And this period of time begins. Is everybody all right? I know this is a little history, but I hope everybody's fine. What, what This period of time began with Constantine. Constantine was there, uh, 312 A.D., I believe it was in October. He goes to this battle, um, and uh, I have the name of the battle. It's the, it's the Malavian Bridge, and he goes to this battle, and he's fighting. And Constantine, again, he's, he's the emperor of pagan Rome, of, of that, that area. And then he, sees, he says he sees this cross in the sky. And, and because of that, he goes and he puts crosses on all the shields of his, of his army. And then they win that victory. And then that convinces him that now Christianity should be the state religion. And you can think what you want to about Constantine. You can think about his uh, conversion as being uh, you know, legitimate or not. I, that, I'm not going to argue about that. But what I will tell you is this spelled doom. This brought a lot of damage to the local church. When he said, we're going to stop all the persecuting of Christians and we're going to make Christianity the state religion, you would think, as we said earlier, well, the church will do better. They're not having their heads cut off. But any time throughout history you see the church merging with the state, bad things are coming. Amen? By the way, we as Baptists, we don't believe in that. Right? We believe in individual soul liberty. Amen? That each person will give account of themselves to God. You're going to stand before God yourself. I can't force Christianity on you. Listen, nobody can, but you can't convert by force. You have to be persuaded of Christ. Amen? You cannot force conversion or coerce conversion on somebody else. You can simply preach Jesus and then make their own decision. But what they were doing in this time was they had entrenched and empowered Christianity by the state and through the state. And that is what led to the formation of the Roman Catholic Church. Amen? It started right here with Constantine. When he takes the church and he merges it together with the state, making this powerful union, and that should not be the case. Listen, let me ask you this. Who, who here thinks that the government is normally pretty terrible about doing everything? Everything they do is pretty terrible. That's, that's my personal belief, that they're bad at everything. Why in the world would we put them in control of the church? 
That doesn't make any sense, right? You could expect the church to go downhill after that, and that's exactly what happened. And Constantine is the one who set this whole, uh, ball, this whole thing in motion. But listen now, not everybody took the bait. Amen? That's what he's saying. He's saying, you held fast to my name. You didn't deny my faith. In a time where everybody else was compromising with the world to make, uh, to make life easier for themselves, you said, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going that way. Amen? No, I believe the Bible. I don't believe that's the way that we ought to do church. There were some people who held to the name of Christ. They said, I'm not going to forsake Him for a convenient place in this society. I'm sticking with God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen? Aren't you glad there's some people that will hold fast to the name of Christ? In a world and a time where everybody else is throwing away the name of Christ, where nobody wants to take a stand for, the, for Christ, nobody wants to take a stand for the Bible and for the Word of God and for holiness, no, everybody's trying to get rid of all those things. You and I need to be a church that holds fast the name of Christ. Listen, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. And I'm not throwing Him away for this world. I'm not throwing Him away for sin. I'm not throwing Him away for a convenient place in our society and for the applause of men. You can have the applause of men. I'll take the applause of Christ. I'd rather Him be pleased with me. Amen. I'd rather Him show me favor than to receive the favor of this world. And so that's what these folks were doing. There were some folks who were trading it in, and but there was a crowd of people who said, no, we are not going to compromise. Tim Fuller said this about this, uh, these churches. He said that Satan tried a few different things with each church. With Ephesus, we already saw, y'all remember, that's the church that left their first love. With Ephesus, Satan tried coldness on the church. And then he said, with Smyrna, Satan tried cruelty. You have that great persecution, right? All of the, the mass slaughter of Christians during that period of time. He said, but with the church at Pergamos, Satan used compromise. What's the old saying? If you can't beat them, join them. And that's what these folks were doing. That's what they were advocating for. That's what Satan uh, did. In an age of compromise, I want to stand with the Lord Jesus. I mean, I don't, I don't want to quit. Even if it leads to what it led to for this Antipas here, which is who was slain in protest. Slain in protest. Look at the last part of verse 13. It says, Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Apparently, one of their own there in the church was martyred for the cause of Christ and for standing against that compromise. And in fact, think about this. The, the name Antipas, Antipas, you have that first part, which is anti, which means against, right? That P-A-S, you know what that literally means? It means all. He was against all. This was a guy who was against everything. That's my kind of preacher right there, amen? Don't you want a preacher that's against everything? I mean, that's who Antipas was. I mean, he, he was just preaching against everything. He's like, I'm not compromising. I'm mad at everything. I mean, I think Lester Roloff kind of embodied a lot of that. I heard Lester Roloff on the radio. He was preaching against air conditioning. He was preaching against bubble gum. You know why? He said, when you chew bubble gum, he said, your mouth is lying to your stomach. That's a sin. He preached it. He was Antipas. I mean, this guy, he, he was just against everything. And listen, I, listen, I'd rather have a preacher that's against everything than one that's for everything. Amen? I mean, it, I, I would rather have an Antipas. I'd rather have somebody who's willing to take a stand, who's willing to preach the Bible, who's willing to be unpopular. He was willing to be slain in protest. He was willing to be a martyr for Christ because he would not compromise with the world. And listen, our Baptist forefathers did that. By the way, Baptists are not Protestant. Protestants are those who came through the Protestant Reformation right of the 1500s. They came out of the Catholic Church and said, well, we want to reform the Catholic Church. That's why they're called reformers. They don't want to destroy the Catholic Church. They just said, no, well, we, we like the Catholic Church. It's the right church. We just need to fix some things. No, Baptists were never a part of the Catholic Church. Amen? Amen? That's what our text just said. It said there was a group of people who held fast the name. They didn't deny the faith. They didn't join up with pagan Rome or papal Rome or any other kind of Rome. They were, they were staying with Jesus. That's what we're going to do. Amen? Amen? By the grace of God, that should be our heart and our desire to stay with Christ and not to compromise. So that is the praise of Pergamos. Secondly, we'll see the problem at Pergamos. Verse number 14. I'm going, to move, I'm, going to start, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Verse number 14. Some of y'all said he was going fast enough already, but I'm, I'm going to speed up a little bit more. Amen. Verse 14. It says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, 
and to commit fornication, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. It is amazing to me. Does anybody else see this? It's amazing to me that verse 13 and verse 14 and 15 could be written to the same church. Isn't that right? You think about all the wonderful things we just saw about the church at Pergamos. They got folks there that are staying in place and they're, they're, they're being slain in protest and they're whatever the other thing I said they were doing. I mean, they're, I mean, they're doing a great job. This church is doing a great job. And the same church that he says, I, I, I can praise you for this, he said, but I've got a problem with you concerning this. And we can sit here and say, well, how in the world could that be? How could they hold fast my name and not deny my faith and at the same time hold the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Here's what I believe. What I believe is this, and I think we would all say that because we've been in church for this for a long time because we've been in church. Not everybody in the church is the same. That's what I believe. I believe simply there, there are some in the church that are that are staying right and they're, they're, they're following Jesus and they're not denying the faith. And then there's some in the church who are trying to bring in the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Listen, now, I don't even believe everybody in this church is saved. Right? Jesus had 12. One of them was a devil. I mean, I think, I, listen, I've heard way too many testimonies of people standing up saying, I was a church member for 30 years and then I got saved. Y'all ever heard that? Some of y'all, that's your testimony, right? I don't ever stand to preach assuming that every single person in the church is saved. It's just probably not the case. And so there are people in this church, some of them who were in love with Jesus and following Jesus, and then there were some of them who were being used by the devil to try to subvert the church and lead them to compromise. Simply put, not everyone in the church is the same. And he tells them there this. He says, Thou hast them there that hold the doctrine. The church was commended in the earlier part of the chapter, earlier part of the verse, verse 13, for, for being separated from the world, right? For standing against the world. So we're not going to let the world influence the church. So they were standing firm against difficulty when it was without. But the problem with this church is not that which was without. It was what was within the church. Right? Amen? He says, thou hast them there. So the problem with this church is what's inside the church, not what's outside the church. I know that Satan's seat is there. I know all these temples, these pagan gods. I know the library, all this other kind of stuff. He said, y'all are doing well at fighting to try to keep the world out. But he's saying, the world's already got in. You and I need to be more concerned with what's going on inside this church. Amen? than what's going on outside this church. It's easy to point fingers at everybody else and every other church and everybody else is a compromiser and everybody else is living for the world and everybody else is lost. It's easy to do that. What about what's going on in the walls of this church? Amen? What about what's going on in your home? What about what's going on in your heart? So it's time to start looking inward at the problem. So that's the problem. The problem's on the inside. This is an inside job, if you will. So what is it? Second, there's two things. They have the doctrine of Balaam. I could spend a lot more time on this than I'm going to, but the doctrine of Balaam. It says that he taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. If you go, if you want to, for homework, uh, Numbers chapter 22 through 25. If you want to go home and read that. Numbers 22 through 25, you'll find the story of Balaam. Balaam was an Old Testament uh, prophet. He was a prophet. And Balak who was the king of Moab, he went to Balaam. He said, hey, I want you to curse Israel. Curse Israel. And so Balaam, he ends up going with him, and, and he opens his mouth to curse Israel three times, and each time a blessing comes out. And then he almost seems to just vanish from the scene there at the end of chapter 24. And if all you had was the Old Testament, it might be hard to understand exactly who Balaam was and what Balaam was doing. But the New Testament sheds light on who Balaam was and what the doctrine of Balaam was. The Bible says this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. He says, "...which hath forsaken the right way, and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness." If you go read Numbers 22 through 25, Balak bribes Balaam 
to come and curse Israel. What that tells me is that, that Balaam was a preacher for hire. You could call him a hireling. That's, that's, what, that's what Balaam was. Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam was a state-sponsored preacher. The Moabites come along, they've got a pretty uh, price. I'm going to help them out. And what we find out, and from this passage of Scripture, Jude alludes to it as well, but in this passage of Scripture, it tells us what Balaam did. It tells us that he, that he taught Balak, he, tells, he pulls Balak, the king of Moab, aside, and he says, hey, here's what you do, all right? He says, every time I open my mouth, God makes me bless them, not curse them. He says, here's how you can make God curse Israel. He, he tells them to cast a stumbling block, Here's how you do it. He says to cause them to commit fornication. When, when Balaam leaves off the scene at the end of Numbers chapter 24, the very next verse is Numbers chapter 25, verse number 1. It says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called uh, the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down unto their gods. What Balaam told Balak was, hey, look, if you'll, if you'll cause the women of Moab to seduce the men of Israel, God will curse them. And they'll go after idolatry. And that's exactly what they did. Amen? And what he's telling them here, the church at Pergamos, is there are some people there who have that same doctrine. They endorse loose living. They endorse immorality. They endorse fornication. Listen, that's still a sin. Amen? It's still a sin. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Amen. Anything outside of the marriage bonds is a sin, right? The Bible says that, that the marriage bed is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. It's still a sin. And the Bible says there were people here in this church who for the wages of unrighteousness, just like Balaam, are, are, are saying, let's cast a stumbling block. Listen, I don't, want to be, I don't want to cast a stumbling block for anybody. I don't want to cause anybody to trip up. I want people to love Jesus and to serve Him. But there were people in the church who were saying, well, it's not that big of a deal. No, it's a big deal. Amen? It's a really big deal. Fornication in the church. Bob Sanders said this. He said that this church, Pergamus, the church marred their beauty by polluting their character. God help us. The church, Jesus said, to be holy for I am holy. Right? Amen? That's what Peter said. That's in the Word of God. Be holy for I am holy. The church is supposed to be a place that upholds some standards and some righteousness, right? I still believe in holy, clean, Christian living. And anything outside of that is Balaam, and it's going to bring destruction and compromise into your life. The doctrine of Balaam, there's also those that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in verse number 15. He says, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. The thing of the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, we mentioned it earlier, the church at Ephesus. He says he, he hates that. Um, and and you can, there's a lot of mystery surrounding the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans or the, church, or the beliefs of them. Uh, people get this from it. When you break down the etymology of that word, uh, when you look at Nico, it comes from the word Nike, which means to conquer. Right? And then you have laetans, which means the people. The word, if you break the word Nicolaitans down, it literally means to conquer the people. And I told you that the Nicolaitans in this period of time, it's leading towards the Roman Catholic Church. What they believed in was apparently by their name uh, to conquer the people, it was a clear distinction between the, the preachers and the people. The clergy and the laity. That, do you not see that in the Roman Catholic Church today? It's Pope worship is what it is. It's elevating these bishops and these cardinals and all these so-called religious authorities and it's Nicolaitan. It's, it's conquering the people. It's putting, it's putting you under their thumb. Church isn't supposed to be that way. Amen? There's no such thing as second class Christians. Just because I'm standing up here doesn't mean I'm better than anybody else. I'm probably worse than everybody else. Listen, it, that, that's not the way that it is. Amen? God doesn't look at somebody and say, oh, they're a preacher or they're a missionary or they're an evangelist or they're a man or they're whatever and say that they're of some kind of more spiritual value than anybody else. Spir I believe in some spiritual authority in the church, but spiritual authority does not mean spiritual supremacy. And that's what they're advocating for. 
That's what the deeds of the Nicolaitans were, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And Jesus says, I hate that. He said, I hate it. Say, can God say that? Absolutely. God hates things. He says in particular, I hate that. 1 Peter 5.3, talking about the, the elders, and uh, it says, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but in samples to the flock. God didn't call me to lord over your life. God didn't co- tell me to, to come into your house and run your home and boss you around, tell you what to do. Listen, God didn't call me to do that. He's the only one that gets to do that. Right? He's Lord. Preacher Wampler, he quoted Brother Rusty Silvertooth when he was here preaching in a revival meeting. He said, this is the job of a pastor. He said, a pastor's job is not to be in charge. The pastor's job is to make sure that nobody else is in charge. The pastor's job is to make sure that Jesus is in charge. Amen? It's an under-shepherd, not an over-shepherd. Jesus is in control. Right? He is the head of the body. He, is, uh, he has the preeminence in this place. The pastor's job isn't necessarily to take charge of everything. It's to make sure that Jesus is in charge of everything and not anybody else. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. So that is the problem in the church. Let's look at the prescription in the church. Verse number 16. Uh, very simply, in one word, he says, here's the prescription, or here's what you need to do. Repent. Right? Repent. That is a a sorrowful change of heart and mind concerning sin. Repentance requires humbling yourself enough to admit that you're in error. Listen, I mentioned earlier that, that, that these are types of churches, right? And I said we haven't got there yet, but I'd love to be a Philadelphia uh, church. The only two churches that Jesus didn't say bad things about was Philadelphia and Smyrna, and one of them was seriously persecuted, and so I'd rather be the one that was not. I'd rather be uh, Philadelphia. And so I I think that that's true, that these are different types of, of, of churches. But also you can say this, in a way, all seven, there's a little bit of each of these churches in every church. Amen? Why is that? Because the church is made up of people. It's made up of people. Y'all are Resurrection Baptist Church. So whatever Resurrection Baptist Church is, it's the accumulation of all of y'all. And me. I'm part of it. All of us. We, we play a part in making Resurrection Baptist Church whatever kind of church it is. And, and I think there are some Philadelphia saints here. And I praise God for that. Amen? But I, but I think there are probably some Pergamos saints here. Some saints, some saints who have some compromise in their life. They've compromised doctrinally, and that has, re- has led to a compromise morally. It starts with your doctrine, right? Are y'all still with me? It starts with what you believe. What you believe determines how you behave. So it starts with a doctrinal problem. And then it ends up with a moral problem. And what he's telling this church is, the church needs to repent of the compromise. Although the entire church is not responsible. So what does that mean? What that tells me is this. The church has an obligation to ensure that there are certain standards upheld at the church. I was talking with a pastor just the other day, a good friend of mine in another state, and and he had this issue in his church. There was a man in his church who disagreed doctrinally with the pastor on some things. And instead of going to the pastor and talking to the pastor about it, he decided, I'm going to start holding Bible studies at my house and inviting everybody in the church except the pastor. This happened. And it gets back to the pastor about what's going on. And I was talking to him. He said, what in the world? I'm, I'm going to have to deal with this. I said, yeah, you are. I said, you, know, you need to bring it before the church. Right? Right? And he brought it before the church, and they, uh, that man would not repent, and they exacted church discipline on that man and removed him from membership. You don't hear about that happening much too more, uh, much uh, you know, these days, but it's biblical. It's right. Why? Because if the church allows things like that to continue and to go on, it's going to harm the body. It's going to hurt... The, the testimony of Christ in the community. You go read in 1 Corinthians chapter, I believe it was chapter 5, 
Well, you have that man, right, who's committing uh, fornication, and the Bible says that they're puffed up about it, and Paul told them to get him out of the church. That's, that's called church discipline. I think it's scriptural. It's biblical. There are times for it. Amen? And that's what he's telling them to do. He's prescribing some repentance in the church to what it, for whatever means necessary, by whatever means necessary. Or if not, there's going to be a punishment. Look in verse number 16. Last part of verse 16, he says, Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Essentially what God is saying is if you don't deal with it, I'm going to deal with it. If I'm in the offender, I'd much rather the church deal with it than God deal with it. Amen? I'd much rather, I'd much rather the church, the preacher, come knocking on my door and, and deal with me and help me than, than God show up with a sore coming out of his mouth to fix the problem. He says it's going to come instantly. I will come into thee quickly. God can intervene at any moment. He says I'm going to come individually to fight against them. He said, I'm not everybody. The, them, the problem, right? I'm going to deal with the issue. We've got a God that's not going to sweep your sin or mine under the rug. He's going to deal with it. This follows with a plea. Verse number 17, there's a plea. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I've mentioned this in the last two, but, and I never really realized this until this study. When he says, he that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What he's saying is that I want for more than just the church at Pergamos to hear this. He says, I'm dealing with the church at Pergamos, but this is for everybody. What he's saying is, Resurrection Baptist Church, I want you to hear what I'm telling the church at Pergamos. When he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches, that's what he's saying. It's for everybody to hear. He's saying, Pergamos, I want you to hear what I'm telling the church at Ephesus. I want, I want you all to hear it. Why? Because there are going to be points in our life when we need every one of these things. When we need every one of these letters to every one of these churches to help our life at a different time. He's saying, he that hath an ear, he is pleading with you to listen. Now some folks have already tuned it out, and I understand that, and that's fine, but God is pleading with you to listen to him. This isn't about me. This isn't about this morning. God, God wants you to listen to Him. He says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And then lastly, each letter ends with a beautiful promise. The promise of verse number 17. It says, To him that overcometh will I give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name. Oh, I skipped one. Uh, he says in verse number 17, let me turn there and read off here. I put it wrong on my notes. It says, He that hath an ear will let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. It begins with this phrase, To him that overcometh. I've already established that in the other messages, but if you go to 1 John chapter 5, what that tells us is, Him that overcometh is him that is saved. Okay? There are people that believe, they're friends of mine, who believe that this, to him that overcometh, is talking about these, these really good Christians. Like there are promises to, to certain Christians about heaven that other Christians aren't going to get, and that that's what these are. Um, I would love for them to explain to me the one where it says, to him that overcometh uh, shall not be heard of the second death. Explain that one to me. <laughs> are only the really good Christians not going to be heard of the second death? Or is everybody that's saved not going to be heard of the second death? It's everybody that's saved. You say, well, what does it mean to overcome? 1 John 5 says, for, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Meaning, if you have faith in Christ, you've overcome this world. So this promise is to everybody. And it's twofold. And I'll go ahead and tell you this. Each one is just as mysterious as the other. The first one, he says, that I will give to eat of the hidden manna. The hidden manna. He said, what in the world is that? Some spiritualize this text to say that when he says hidden manna, he's talking about communion with Christ. Um, and we do know, John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am that manna, right? He says in, in chapter 6, verse John 6, 35, he says, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So I do believe that, right? Jesus is the manna, absolutely. Um, and so it's saying in heaven we'll feast on Christ in a spiritual 
sense. This could also be physical manna. Like when you get to heaven, you'll get to eat the manna that they ate in the wilderness. And they would say, well, why in the world would it be hidden? Why is it called the hidden manna? Well, you think about that manna. They haven't seen manna in thousands of years. All that manna was gone. When they crossed over Canaan, they weren't eating manna anymore. Right? Right? When they got into Canaan land, no more manna. But what happened? They took a little bit of manna and put it in a jar. And the Bible says it's in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, now who got to see that? Nobody. The high priest only went in there once a year to apply blood to the mercy seat. It doesn't say he was opening the Ark of the Covenant and he was moving things around. So this manna was hidden, you could say, right? It, it, was, it was something that was, that was put aside in a, in a secret place. But, but it could be that when we get to heaven, we're going to get to eat of that hidden manna. We're going to get to experience that and, and, and understand what they went through in the wilderness. I don't know. Either way... What this text does say, when he says that you'll be able to eat of the hidden manna, it's, it's presenting heaven as a place of unique access. You're going to get to eat of hidden manna. It's saying that you're going to get to experience more than you're experiencing down here. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? I'm looking forward to getting to heaven and being able to experience some things that I can't experience in this sinful body. When I, when I have a glorified body, I'll be able to experience some glorified things. And I'm looking forward to that. One of those is going to be this hidden manna. And secondly, lastly... He tells them that you're going to get a white stone. He says, and, and we'll give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. The text says that no man knoweth. I'm going to go ahead and tell you what that means, all right? That means when it says no man knoweth, it says don't call the preacher because he doesn't know it either. All right? That's what that means. I'd be, I'd be ignorant to get up here and tell you I know exactly what that new name is because the Bible says no man knows it. You know, that would make no sense at all. So I, I'm not exactly sure what this means, this white stone with a new name that no man knows, saving he that receiveth it. They say that during this period of time that, that juries, when they would cast a selection of innocent or guilty, they would do it with, with a white stone, right? A black stone would be, you've heard about being blackballed, if you will. It, it's, it's a secret ballot. You have that black stone that would represent guilt. That white stone represents innocence. You could say that in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and, our, you and I are innocent, Right? We, we've been justified by faith. Our sins are gone. We have the righteousness of Christ. And you and I get to receive that, that white stone of being innocent in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and about this, this new name, um, you know, some would say that this is a reference to, and I, this makes for good preaching whether it's right or not. Amen? Some would say that this new name was, is a reference to the adoption process. That when someone was adopted, especially during this period of time, and what happens today, you get a new name, Right? We've got kids here, so they've been adopted. When they got adopted, they got a new name. And you and I know that when we see Jesus, the Bible, Romans chapter 8, calls that the redemption of the body. It calls it the adoption. Amen? That we're waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. Meaning when we see Jesus, we're going to be like Him. Remember what 1 John 3 says? That we'll be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And throughout that adoption process, it would not surprise me one bit if I got a new name. A new name representing promotion. You see throughout the Bible when people got new names, you and I know him as Paul, but he used to be Saul. Right? You and I know him as Israel. He used to be Jacob. You and I know him as Abraham. Well, it used to be Abram. You go throughout the Bible, there's a series of people getting new names, getting promotions. We'll talk about one more tonight. Uh, but, but, but you and I, one of these days, are going to be promoted. Amen? To a new place, a new land where all the former things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And because of that, because of the splendor of heaven and what you and I have ahead of us, we have way too much we're looking forward to to compromise down here. Amen? Amen? Let's ask God to help us to be the Christians, to be the church that God wants us to be, not to be a church of compromise, not to be a church that sweeps things under the rug, but deals with sin in our life. We repent of God, or repent to God for the sin in our life. And enjoy his blessings. Amen. Miss Alicia, if you'll move towards the piano.